Welcome once again to another bone snapping edition of the Boner. Grab your Bible, open up back okay, application on your phone, or we'll put up a web browser, however you will follow along in Holy Scripture, because we here at the Boneyard believe in sola scriptura. You may be saying, Kevin, that sounds like Latin, and you would be correct. That's Latin, that means the scriptures and the scriptures alone. So open up your, your Bible, because we don't believe that the uh, uh, a new revelation trumps Holy Scripture. We don't believe that the Watchtower, the Book of Mormon, the, uh, we don't believe that personal revelation or, or God told me trumps Holy Scripture. The Christian is under authority of Holy Scripture. So grab your Bible, open up to the book of John, John chapter 19. Now, if you've been following along with us in our series of John, you know we're knee deep in good rich theology. If you remember last episode, the, the episode called Barabbas, we asked the question, have you ever traded Jesus for Barabbas? You're saying, Kevin, what are you talking about? Go back and watch that episode. Have you ever traded Jesus, wanting a murderer and a robber, someone, something that, that, that takes from us, takes from us and, and robs from us, those things that, get, that God calls us and commands us not to do? Well, we prefer those things over Jesus like the crowd does in John chapter 18. Now, opening up to John, John chapter 19, we're going to focus on one individual and put him beside Jesus and we're going to compare the two one is Pilate he is one of the one of the overseers one of the governors of the of the Jews in this era he usually is stationed in Caesarea and Jesus has now been brought before him by the religious the religious Pharisees the Sadducees the the scribes and the lawyers have been brought Jesus the religious have brought Jesus to them and accused him of blasphemy calling him an evildoer and what does Pilate do well let us focus let us take a moment and look Look at this person known as Pilate picking up in John chapter 19. Let us begin John chapter 19 verse 1. And Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. Let's stop right there. If we just read over this, we'll say flogged. That's not a big deal. Even in our culture, we don't use that word very much, but it's a, it's a huge deal. Flogging is another word for scourging. To take the, the, the person, the prisoner who's accused of a crime and to stretch them out. They would take his hands and they would, they would bind them together and cause him to rise them above his head, to stretch out his back. Then they would take a, a, a whip with three different sections that had metal and bone and glass and even on the end of some a, a mace ball with spikes and even on the end of some of those stripes leather stripes would be a, even a rake and when it goes across his victim's back it would rip the flesh from his back they would allow 40 lashes but Jesus took 39 to 40 lashes as tradition Jesus was flogged. But notice what Pilate said as he brings Jesus to those who are accusing him over and over. Pilate says, this, this man is innocent. This man has done no wrong. But Pilate, in a position to protect the innocent, to protect him to, to serve, he still compromises because of the, the pressure of the religious zealots who are crying out for Jesus' blood. Pilate takes Jesus and flogs him and scourges him. See, it wasn't enough that Pilate goes and just crucifies Jesus, has it commanded that Jesus gets crucified. See, Pilate said in his, in his heart, in his mind, as we read in, in John chapter 18, he wanted to set Jesus free. He saw that Jesus 
Jesus was innocent, that he was a good man. He, he had a conversation with Jesus and asked him what is truth. He asked him, where did he come from? See, to think about Pilate as many Roman officials in this day, he was very superstitious. Romans, Romans were pagans. They, they believed in many different gods and they were very, very superstitious, much like the people in our society today. They're very spiritual. They don't necessarily believe in the God of the Bible, but they're very spiritual. Spiritual, we can see from the, the series of Harry Potter and Twilight and, 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 and all this paranormal activity that people are so interested in. They would m- mostly uh, say that they are uh, spiritual and not necessarily Christian when this applies to Pilate, as Pilate is a Roman pagan who was definitely spiritual. And now he wants to release Jesus as he sees he is divine. He, he's worried because if we read in other Gospels, we know that we know that Pilate was given a warning from his own wife who had a dream about Jesus. See, this is how God even reaches out to the pagan. He'll send many warnings. He'll send people speaking to them. He'll use shows like The Boneyard. He'll use contemporary songs. He'll use secular songs. He'll use a a Facebook status. He'll use a Twitter post. He'll use a a text message or just a kind comment from someone to remind us that God is real, that Jesus died for sinners, how he's tender and merciful to each even pagans, religious and rebellious people. Jesus here is flogged by Pilate. But why? Why did he flog him? Why did he scourge him? Why did he rip the, the, lacerate his back and pull skin and rip down into the tissue and the, mu- the muscle? See, history tells us, Josephus and other historians tell us that many people have died from just the scourging of the Romans. That the, the wicked Roman soldiers who were trained in, in torturing their, their victims would joy and take turns lashing and when this one got tired from swinging his arm the other one his partner would take a turn and they would enjoy lashing and beating Jesus as they ripped away flesh from his back why was this a reason that Jesus had to be scourged we can go back and to read in the old testament in Isaiah It's been prophesied that Jesus had to be beaten had to be scourged he had to be humiliated but why Let us turn to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah, prophet, spoke about Jesus' coming. See, the the Jews, they wanted a Messiah. They were looking for a Messiah, but not that Messiah, not Jesus. He's humble. He's a carpenter. His hands are calloused. He's not riding on a white horse covered in glimmering armor, shining gold, and striking down the Romans. And He's not liberating the, the Jews and setting God's kingdom on the earth. This is not the Messiah they wanted. They didn't want a suffering. Messiah that was spoken about by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3. This is describing Jesus. Isaiah says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Isaiah says that we'll hide our faces from him. We don't esteem him. We don't hold him in high regard. He was acquainted with sorrows and grief. I don't know about you, Boneyard, but that verse means a lot to someone like me. See, a Jesus who never suffered, a Jesus who never wept and cried, how would he ever wipe the tears from my eyes? How would Jesus know what suffering is if he didn't go through it himself? How can Jesus have sympathy for me, someone like me, who's struggling, trying to get to heaven, trying to work out my salvation with fear and trembling, having faith in him, having the lashes that this world puts across my back? How could he relate to someone like me if he himself hadn't already bore those griefs? Look at what Isaiah says in chapter chapter 53, verse 4. Surely... He bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Look at verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah is saying that he was wounded for our transgressions. You're saying, Kevin... Put this in layman's terms, transgressions. What does that mean? When we sin against God, 
when we daily assault his holiness, when we rebel against God, we shake our fists at God and do the opposite of what he commands, when we're gluttonous, when we're lustful, when we're unforgiving, when we're, we're, we're unfaithful, when we're idol worshiping, when we're blaspheming his name, he was wounded for our transgressions. You're saying, Kevin, but why do I still go through hard times in this life? Why do I still struggle? Well, I'm not giving you some kind of powder puff, bakery, cream-filled gospel here. You're going to have a hard time. Jesus tells us, don't, don't, don't fear not, for I have overcome the world. In this world, you will have many troubles. If you read in our last few episodes, you will have a hard time. And for those gospel preachers, gospel preachers, you notice I'm doing the quotes, who say that life is easy and it's all about Skittles and chocolate and candy, woo, coloring books and, and marbles. No, no, no. For the Christian, it's hard. For the Christian, you will go through trials and tribulation. Like my pastor says, the heaven's gate's really low. The reason it's so low is because many of us, all of us, have to crawl through on our hands and knees, humble before a mighty God. Yes, well, our backs will get stripes in this world, but the sting is gone because of what Jesus has done. By his stripes we are healed. We are blessed are the poor in spirit, like Jesus tells us the Sermon on the Mount. For people like me who are poor in spirit, Blessed am I because he bore my stripes. Yes, I, I have heartache and troubles. And yes, I do cry tears. But I have hope. I have hope that this pain isn't for nothing. That I have a, a better inheritance. There's something better for me on the other side. I pity for the atheists because this is all they have. The, the heartache and the struggle and the pain and the loss. But for the Christian, there's something better. Yes, it hurts. Our hearts ache at tra tragedy and loss. But we know there's something better. That Christ, that Christ bore the wrath that was meant for us. The, the, the wrath that was uh, aimed at us, Christ took and soaked it up. Pulling all the wrath that was meant for someone like you and me. Pouring it upon himself to save wretched sinners. Look at what Isaiah says. He was crushed. For our iniquities. And maybe you're saying wherever you're watching right now. Maybe you're watching from your hospital bed. You're, you're looking at a pink slip. Somebody fired you from your job. You've been laid off. You're saying, Kevin, I feel pretty crushed right now. But can't Jesus relate to where you are? See, he's not some little idol God sitting on the shelf gathering dust. Jesus bled and cried and he can relate. He carries our iniquities in his body by his stripes. Jesus, Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him, the chastisement brought us peace. Now that big word chastisement brought us peace. What, is, what does that mean? Hey, we hear it's a cliche. Really good preachers say it constantly, but they don't really explain what the chastisement of a, that brought us peace, the price of our peace. See, you could be watching the bone yard right now from your hospital bed, your body riddled with cancer. You could be at your baby's funeral and you're putting your children in the ground because they died. You can have a stillborn child and, and you can still be watching the bone yard right now. You, you, you could be holding your loved one's hand as they're giving their last breath and they're passing on into eternity. You could be looking at your bank account and there's nothing in it. You could be losing your home or, or you can have a house fire. You could be naked and famine and in sword and still have peace. How? Because Jesus... Pay the price for our peace. We can kiss the afflictions that are coming into our life, kissing the rod because they come across God's desk saying, Kevin will have to go through this because it will make him more into the image of Christ. He, he will have to go through cancer or sickness. He'll have to go through famine, nakedness, and sore. He will have to go through those things because the plasticness of pride must be rubbed down until the old rugged cross is seen. So if you're suffering, if you're, if you're going through something and it, it's the lashes across your back and life is just kicked you and it's kicked you while you're down know that the chastisement that brought us peace was paid for by Christ that you can suffer well that you can turn your eyes and your head towards heaven and say Jesus even though I'm struggling I'm going through this and my knees are buckling I'm crawling and I'm groveling and Jesus is like you don't even hear me and you don't even see me 
that he paid the price for the peace that you gather in your heart, knowing that you are reconciled with God, that God is not angry with you, that whatever affliction that's coming your way is making you into the image of Christ, and now you can suffer. Suffer well and give him glory. Give him glory through the cancer. Give him glory through the the pain. Give him glory through the depression. Give him glory and honor through whatever comes your way. No, this is not the prosperity gospel. This is the gospel of peace. This is the gospel of peace that Jesus bore our iniquities. The wrath that was meant for someone like me, rebellious and religious, Jesus bore my sins in his body, dying for wretched, wicked, evil men. And by his stripes, we are healed. We are lepers covered from hands to our heads to our toes to the soles of our feet. We are lepers with pus of pride oozing out with our self-righteousness. And by his stripes, we are healed. Look at verse 6 in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah goes on talking about Jesus. We are all like sheep gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In the Old Testament, we see story after story where the little animals, the lambs, die for the sins of the sins of the people. But in the New Testament, we see the story of the shepherd. The shepherd dying for the the people, the lambs. We see the the good shepherd, Jesus, dying for his lambs. The, The iniquity of us all. There's a price to be paid for our sins. There's a price to be paid for our lust and our lying, our gluttony and our, and our anger and unforgiveness and our idol worship, our sins that we love and crave, our pet sins that we hold on to when we feed and we allow it to live and prosper and stay alive. Like John Owen says, be killing sin or it will be killing you. We see the, the reason Jesus had to be scourged because if Jesus never wept, never went through pain, how can a God like that relate to little old me. See, Buddha, Buddha can't relate to you. He's dead. Muhammad, he can't relate to you. Allah can't relate to you. They're not real. They're demon gods. Joseph Smith can't relate to you. He's dead. He's laying in a family cemetery. But Jesus suffered. He groaned in his spirit. He cried. He bore our sicknesses. The price of our peace was laid upon him. The wrath of God was lapped up by the blood of Jesus. Jesus saved sinners. Now, putting Jesus on the pedestal. Now let us bring along beside him. Pilate. Now we know why Jesus was scourged, why he was flogged. Look at Pilate now. Let us keep our eyes on Jesus, but let our our, our eyes also see Pilate. See, we can't be neutral about Jesus. Yeah, we can be, uh, we believe that we can be neutral like Switzerland spiritually about Jesus. To keep Jesus on good terms and say, yeah, Jesus is a good guy. I, I don't want to be affiliated with him, but I don't want to offend him in case, uh, uh, in case he's right and he really is a good guy and he really is the God man. Many of us are living our lives like we're pilots. You're saying, Kevin, what are you talking about? We're very religious and spiritual, but we're not. Christians under the authority of Scripture. We're, see, what, here's what Pilate did. Look in verse 2 of chapter 19, John chapter 19, verse 2. And the, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on Jesus' head, arraying him in a purple robe. And they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck, them, struck him with their hands. Then Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I'm bringing you. See, I'm bringing him to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. And so Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and purple robe. And Pilate said to him, behold the man. See, Jesus was trying to humiliate. um, Pilate was trying to humiliate Jesus to take away all his credibility. Imagine Jesus standing there twitching and shocked and covered with a, a purple robe stained with his blood and a crown of thorns. And he's showing the religious crowd that are crying for his blood. And Pilate is responsible for taking care and protecting those who are innocent. And again, Pilate says, I find no guilt in him. And he says, behold the man. How fitting. 
that standing there in that crown of thorns and, and that blood caked robe is the perfection of humanity. The second Adam, all that all humanity aspires to what they should be and could be is in Jesus. And Pilate says, behold the man. And when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Notice the religious, the ones who should be at the feet of Jesus aren't saying, crown him, crown him, Lord of all. They were screaming, crucify him, crucify him. Crucify him. But look at what Pilate says. He says again, I find no guilt in him. And not only does he say that, in Matthew 27, verse 24, turn there quickly. This is what the other gospels say that Pilate does. In Matthew 27, verse 24, and when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was about to begin, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. So, G so Jesus is standing there, judged before the religious, and this pagan, pagan Roman stands there and washes his hands of the whole ordeal. Many of us, many of us live our lives like Pilate. We don't want to offend Jesus, and we like to keep him on good terms. We don't want to say, ah, Jesus, man, I'll take him or leave him. It's like saying, oh, I believe in seeing I don't. They're good or bad. I can take him or leave him. I, can, I think parachutes are okay. I can take him or leave him. I believe in bulletproof vests. I can take him or leave him. No big deal. You can't be that way about Christ. Even though Pilate washed his hands and said, I have nothing to do with this. You can't live your life that way. Pilate's blood, the blood of Jesus was still on Pilate's hand. Many of us believe that we can wash away our sins with water from a basin like Pilate did. He was required by the Roman law to protect those who were innocent. So he was an accomplice to this murder also. Jesus was innocent. He never lied. He never committed adultery. He never looked with lust upon a woman or a man. He never had any idols. He never blasphemed God's holy name. He never stole anything. He honored the Lord. He lived with God with all his heart, mind, and soul. Yet Pilate tried to wash his hands clean of the whole thing. The truth is, those who are watching viewer, you can't just live a casual life with Jesus and say, I can take him or leave him. Almost like dating Jesus, that you might call him once in a while when you need something. That you, you say, well, I want to keep him on good terms and keep him as an ally, but I wouldn't say I'm his friend. You can't walk the fence with Christ. Even if, if your hands have been in that basin, if you washed your hands and say, I don't really have nothing to do with this religion thing. I don't really have nothing to do with that I, I don't want to I want to be on good terms with Jesus in case I die and get to heaven well if you're doing that you're doing what Paul says in Romans he says that you're trying to apply your own righteousness see you're you're covered from head to toe with sin stained in your soul and you've offended the holy God and God has supplied a payment, an appeasement to extinguish the holy fire that burns against you. But you, you casually toss it to the side and say, I want to keep it on good terms because I want to live like I want to. See, I, I kind of like Jesus, but I don't want to do what he says. I, I, I like the idea of church, but I don't want to live under spiritual authority of a local pastor. I don't want to read my Bible and, and be a disciple and be under discipline. I, I kind of like Jesus. I'm kind of washing my hands of this whole thing that I, I'll be innocent. There is no middle straddling line. The water in that basin didn't wash the blood off his hands. You're still stained in your soul. You're like a leopard spiritually. A leopard spiritually with open wounds on your soul. And you need a healer. Standing beside Jesus on judgment day. The one who's been proven innocent, innocent, innocent who's good and righteous and holy, never sinning against a holy God. You will be standing there and you must give an account for your life. If we read in Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. Standing before God and Jesus, how would you barter? How will you pay for your way? Yeah, you were on good terms with Jesus, but you never fully committed and trusted in him and let him be the Lord of your life. How would you barter with Christ? Would you give him the money in your wallet? Will you say, I'll give you my 401k, my firstborn? What will you do? There's been an appeasement for your sins. 
There's been a, a price for the peace that should be in your heart. There's a price against, there's been a price for the sins that you've committed against the Holy God. And trusting Jesus, trusting God is the only way to heaven. Trusting Him like a parachute, holding and gripping upon it, holding and living, living by His words and His commandments. Those who trust Christ, those who believe in what He says, trust in Him, trust in what Jesus has done. Repent, throw those sins down, trust in Jesus, repent of your sins and trust in Jesus.